Hi, I'm Sandy Haney. Welcome to Christian Ed Hour at Great Valley Presbyterian Church. This is week three of a series on the New Testament epistles. Today we'll be doing some fun facts and introducing Romans and Philemon in part one. And then in part two, we'll be looking at a passage from Philemon. Actually, we'll be looking at the whole book um, because it's quite short. Please feel free to join us on Sunday at 9 a.m. for a Zoom conversation where we'll be looking at a passage from Romans. And through all of this, we're asking how is the theology of the letters challenging us to live practically or to apply to our lives what we're reading about God, about Christ. So I hope that you find it enriching and rewarding. This week, we have three different fun facts. Fun fact one, names in the letters served an important social role. Fun fact two, messengers, often slaves, delivered the letters. The letters usually include a recommendation for the messenger. And fun fact three, gifts often accompanied letters. Now, let me talk in some detail about each of these. Fun fact one, Names in the letters served an important social role. In the letters, we see many names, particularly in the beginning and the end of each letter. Um, I'm going to refer to Philemon and Romans as an example. And also, I know that there are multiple ways pr to pronounce Philemon, but in first grade, I learned it as Philemon and it has just stuck. And no matter what I do, I struggle to correct it. So um, part of my mispronunciation. Anyway, um, when we look at different ways that letters functioned, one of the things that they did is they were ways to establish connections between the author and the recipients. So the author of the letter or authors of the letters um, would name the recipients and in so doing would establish some kind of relationship with them or remind them of a relationship which they already shared. Um, by doing this, it affirmed the status of the authors and the recipients and made evident the social networks in which they participated. So. In the ancient world, who you knew mattered a lot. Social networking was not new for us. Rather, it's been going on for thousands of years. And in um, the early Christian period, certainly social networking was key. Um, we see in the letters that social networking is happen happening quite a bit because people are mentioning names. Um, Paul particularly name drops. We'll look um, on Sunday during Zoom at Romans 16, where Paul basically name drops the entire time. And there are really important reasons for this. Um, what we're going to look at today is Philemon. But again, names in the letters serve an important social role. They refer to the honor and the status of the people. Now, this is important because often um, the author of some of the letters, at least Paul, was writing from prison. And so when he's writing from prison, his social status appears quite low. However, the way that he writes is one of the ways that he can reassert his authority or his honor. And part of that happens by connecting himself with powerful people in the local churches. So for instance, when he writes to Philemon um, and talks about their close relationship, Paul is establishing again his own authority and his own importance. Um, we also see that by acknowledging these relationships, you could create obligations of friendship or patronage. So by naming people and claiming relationship with them, you are often putting people in some kind of um, acknowledged relationship where there were obligations. So even among friends, there were obligations to reciprocate gifts, um, to, to give to one another. There were obligations for patrons, um, usually wealthy people, to serve their clients or to care for those in their need. There were obligations for heads of households to care for a wide variety of people attached to their household. So again, by using um, names, the writer could kind of remind the recipients, hey, I know you, we have a relationship. And in that relationship, there are going to be certain obligations and roles. And then the author often can discuss them. Even more, however, um, often these relationships, particularly in the Pauline letters, but also certainly in the other letters in the New Testament, create what scholars call a fictive kinship. In other words, they create a family in Christ. So these letters serve very much to create a family, they use familial language, brother, sister, father. Um, they tend to 
create um, a sense that the early Christian community, the ecclesia, which means fellowship or assembly, is really a family and as such needs to act like a family. So by using um, familiar language, by referring to people in familiar terms or in terms that have to do with being co-workers or partners, they really set up a family. And families in the ancient world weren't just mother, father, daughter, son. Instead, they were multiple generations. They would include slaves. They would include um, neighbors. They could include a wide variety of people. And so the Christian community also looks like that. And these letters, by by um, reaching out to different names and using names, certainly establish a sense of that. And of course, for us, they thankfully provide information about people in the community. We might not know very much about the individuals mentioned, but we do know some names and sometimes we hear a description of them and we learn about their roles. So that's a great glimpse into the social networks of the early church. And uh, it begs all sorts of discussion about who did what and what roles were. And uh, I think that's quite fun. I wanted to read um, just as an example, though, in Philemon, um, the very beginning of it says, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. And then at the end of the letter, um, he says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Basically, Paul begins and ends most of his letters with names. And this is great because from the beginning, he establishes a relationship. Philemon, my dear friend, my co-worker, when he's referring to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, they are either other members in the community or leaders in the community, or perhaps Philemon's wife, maybe his son, we're not particularly sure. But Paul is going to claim very early on, you are my beloved, you are my co-worker, we're in this together, and he's going to use familial language, and he's establishing a relationship where certain things would be expected of each partner, um, of each person, and then by ending with Epaphras and Mark, our Sarkis, Demos, and Luke, I mean, he's again saying, hey, and we have all of these ties and connections, and other people are greeting you, and so he's establishing and creating and reinforcing um, connections between people in the ecclesia, people who are working with Paul. And so we have kind of a broader social network being created. So the names really did serve an important social role because these letters functioned to help create connections and um, community and even family. Now, my second fun fact for this week was that messengers, often slaves, delivered the letters. The letters usually include a recommendation for the messenger. So private citizens um, like Paul, Peter, John would not necessarily have had access to the postal service that the Romans sort of used. Um, instead, what they would do is rely on friends, companions, people who are traveling to take letters from one place to another, but often they relied on slaves. Um, slaves could be well-educated. Um, certainly, they could often read the letter, but they could travel and take the letter as well. And we know that um, there are many people when it comes to Paul's letters who are delivering letters back and forth and Paul's going to make, in, make mention of them. Um, in Romans 16, um, we actually have a great example of somebody who is far from a slave, um, but who is going to deliver the letter of Paul to the Roman church. And in this, he includes a recommendation for the messenger. So often in the letters, you'll see something about um, I commend this person to you or some kind of praise about a person. And that's usually the person who would have been delivering the letter. Now, in Romans 16, it's Phoebe. So let me read to you Romans 16 verses one to two. I commend to you our dear sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Secrini, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you, for she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. Now, in this, Paul mentions that Phoebe has an important position in the church as a deacon, and she's also a benefactor, in other words, a patroness. So Phoebe is most likely a very wealthy woman, and in her travels to Rome, she is going to take this letter um, for Paul and deliver it. Now, another week, I'm going to talk about what happens when it gets there. Um, certainly, the person who delivered the letter would be expected to either help interpret it or perhaps give it some context or could... Um, help the recipients understand parts that they didn't know because the, the person who was delivering it most likely was present or who had 
had heard Paul read it or knew something of what was in it. Um, but we'll talk more about what happened when they received it another week. For now, um, it is interesting to know that so many people were traveling and carrying letters. And again, many of these people were slaves. So particularly in wealthy households, a slave often served as a messenger. And my fun fact three um, is that letters often were accompanied by a gift. Now, we don't necessarily have evidence that any of the New Testament letters themselves were accompanied by a gift of any particular note. Um, we do know that that Paul sort of considers Onesimus a gift because um, he says he's sending his very own heart back to him, but really that's just a recommendation for Onesimus. Um, but one of the things that the New Testament letters do make clear is that people have sent letters and gifts to Paul. So Paul makes references, for instance, in Philippians um, to people who have come like Timothy, Epaphroditus, um, mainly Epaphroditus in Philippians, who have come and have served him and worked on behalf of him. And so they likely brought a gift. In Philemon, um, one of the theories is that Onesimus was sent by Philemon to serve Paul. And in that case, he would have brought gifts with him. And whatever letter of recommendation he would have taken from Philemon to Paul would have included a gift. Um, I know there, there were letters that accompanied, for instance, a gift of fish. Uh, but again, the New Testament letters don't necessarily refer much to those. Um, but I thought it worth mentioning. Um, I do want to make sure that I talk a little bit about Romans and Philemon before getting to part two. So let's turn to the letter to the Romans. And while it tends to be a city that most people know, we're going to look at a map and then I'll tell you a little bit about the community in Rome. Paul's letter to the Romans is written to various churches in Rome, the major city of the Roman empire at this time. One of the things we know about Rome is that it has many different ecclesia or assemblies, many different churches. So when Paul writes the letter to the Romans, he's actually writing um, to multiple little churches and we know that he expects that they're going to pass this around. Um, Paul, in fact, didn't have a relationship with the Romans. He goes to them according to Acts at the very end of his life and likely dies there under Nero. But Paul didn't have a relationship with the Roman churches. And so um, he needs to establish his apostolic authority. He needs to kind of cover his bases and show that he knows his theology. And he needs to address issues that the community is having. And he needs to do this all as a stranger to the community. So Paul writes to Romans um, quite a long letter, often considered his magnum opus, his greatest treatise, but it's also a letter. It's a pastoral letter addressing real pastoral concerns. Now we know that within the Roman Ecclesia, there were issues because the church, as far as we know, began with Jews who accepted Jesus as Messiah. Then, however, under Claudius, a number of them were expelled from Rome, um, including Prisca and um, Aquila. So they were expelled from Rome and then the church became largely Gentiles who were followers of Jesus. But by the time Paul writes, we suspect it looks like Jewish Christians have returned. And so we have Christ-believing communities who are Jew and Gentile and are struggling to get along, don't know how this works, are really battling um, for who are kind of the rightful owners. And so Paul is going to address these Jewish Gentile questions and issues, issues of salvation. He's going to use many analogies, expositions of the Old Testament, and numerous rhetorical devices to get his point across. Um, but Romans carries or covers a wide variety of topics and issues from spiritual battles to practical living to the place of Israel, and it is a fantastically long and beautiful letter. Um, one way that I think can sometimes describe one of its driving lessons or themes is that Paul argues in it that all sin, so everyone, Jew, Gentile, whoever you are, we are sinners, all will be judged. Christ is the judge and we will be judged by God, but all can be saved through faith in Christ or through the faithfulness of Christ. And so Paul really um, is driving home what it means to be a person in this world. And, it, and what he says is it doesn't really matter who you are, Jew or Gentile, but you all will face God's judgment, but also all can be saved through the faithfulness of Christ. And, and he teases that out and 
expounds on it all throughout the letter. So that is the letter to the Romans. Now, now when we're looking at the letter to Philemon, it becomes a little more difficult to pinpoint where he actually was. We suspect, however, that he was most likely at Colossae. Um, and that is where we're going to loosely place him, but we're not entirely sure. However, that is probably where Philemon and his home church are. Again, we can't say that with certainty, so a question mark. Now, Philemon is Paul's shortest letter, and it's definitely a kinship letter. We'll be looking at that. And we know that Philemon is a patron. He's a wealthy benefactor. He has helped Paul and other followers of Christ. And so he is a very active Christ follower who also um, acts as a pater familias, a head of the household. He is quite influential and very helpful to Paul. Now, what goes on can be a little tricky to discern, and I'll talk about that in part three, but we know that there's a situation involving Paul, Philemon, and Philemon's slave Onesimus. And so the letter is a letter that Paul wrote to accompany Onesimus on his way back to Philemon, and that is sort of the major part of it. Um, it deals with issues of slavery and so certainly has a long history of being interpreted, sometimes perhaps wrongly, um, in issues of slavery, but it's not just addressing slavery, it's also addressing early Christian community and kinship. So we'll be looking at that more today. Um, so that is our situation where these places might have been. I hope that's helpful. Before moving to part two, I want to offer just a few reflection questions for us to consider and ponder as we go about our week. So first, how do we maintain, establish, or deepen relationships with our church today? So what does that look like? Paul was able to use letters to establish relationships, to affirm them, to encourage them, to continue them, to deepen them. How do we do that? Um, sometimes that involves letter writing, certainly, but, but what are other ways that we are working on Christian fellowship and deepening relationships in our church? Also, this is just an imagination kind of thing. But if you had to visit a new group of Christians, so if you had to go to a community and you didn't know anyone, who would recommend you? Um, who in your life knows you well enough that they could recommend you or, or write a recommendation letter to you in the way that Paul so often recommends his messengers? And if you don't have an answer to that, then perhaps a question is, why not? Um, what can you be doing to establish a relationship with a brother or sister in Christ who can know you and would be able to say, oh yes, I know this person and their spiritual walk and, and I'm walking with them in fellowship. Third, in what way are different statuses or roles among people both a blessing and hindrance in the church? So Although we don't always like to talk about it or acknowledge it, our society still remains fairly stratified. Maybe not to the extent um, that Paul's society was, or at least not as obviously as, as it was, but, but certainly people have different statuses, positions, roles. How is that a blessing? When is that a blessing? When is that a hindrance or a problem? And how do we engage those issues? Fourth, how might we help people feel a part of our family in our church? Um, or how do we act as a family in our other Christian groups, our life groups, our Bible studies with our Christian friends? How do we actually put into practice being a family? That's something I hope that we keep asking and that we'll ask after the next part as well. And last, um, do we keep in mind that our family of brothers and sisters in Christ is a global family. How do we act in a global way? One of the things that the letters of the New Testament um, do for us is that they remind us that even in its earliest days, Christianity grew rapidly, spread rapidly, and the different ecclesias, the different Christ followers saw one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and acted very much like a family. So how are we doing that? How are we engaging other Christ believers outside of our local church? How are we in relationship with them, supporting one another, encouraging one another, praying for one another? I think these are the sorts of questions that the letters challenge us to think about. And I hope that they serve as a good point of reflection for you this week. Now let's move on to part two. For part two, I'm going to read 
the book of Philemon, it's or the letter to Philemon is not that long, um, but it's easier to read the whole thing rather than break it into parts. Also, what I'm going to do, which I don't think I will do in any other week, um, is give you some theories about different ways to read this letter, because really this is a difficult letter to interpret because people differ on the situation that spurs this letter. Um, so we are going to read the letter. I'll give you three theories, and then I'm just going to point out some things that have to do with kinship and then go over some reflection questions. So that's how we're going to proceed. The letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I've become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about you owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. One thing more, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demos, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So in this very short letter, we see many things that could be quite important. One of the questions, though, really is, what is going on here? There are three different ways that scholars tend to read Philemon, and these are certainly contested, and we're not necessarily going to pick any of them today, but I wanted to make you aware of different ways that this is read, because how we read it definitely impacts what we think is going on, um, what we think the point of the letter is, why it might be included in the canon, and it certainly has import for how we understand it in relation to the institution of slavery. So first, the fugitive slave theory, which was particularly popular during the Civil War, um, argues that Onesimus stole money and ran away from Philemon. He's arrested. When he's in prison, he meets Paul and he converts. Then Paul returns Onesimus to Philemon, so he's sending the fugitive slave back, even though that goes against some teachings in Deuteronomy, I think in verse chapter 23, 15. Um, but Paul returns Onesimus to Philemon and repays the stolen money. So that is a classic way of reading it. This is a letter that supports the fugitive slave theory and um, the situation is that Onesimus has run away, stolen money, but he converts and now Paul is sending him back to Philemon, but now he is a fellow brother in Christ. The second theory, which spends quite a bit of time paying attention to the Greek words that are used and the economic language of the letter is often called the sent slave theory. This theory says that Philemon sent Onesimus to Paul to serve him. So Onesimus ends up with Paul because Philemon sent him. Onesimus is Philemon's slave. And so Philemon sends him to serve Paul in prison, which does make sense because we know that um, when someone was in prison awaiting trial, they were dependent upon relationships with friends or community people to serve them, to provide for them, to give them whatever they might need. 
in this case, um, Onesimus still likely converts while he's with Paul. And then Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon. So Onesimus's time is up and now he has to return to Philemon. And so this theory says, so the letter is written because Paul is asking Philemon to free Onesimus and send Onesimus back to Paul so that he can help Paul more. Um, and in this case, Paul will cover the debt, and the scholars who support this theory suggest that the debt is likely related to Onesimus's slavery. We know that often people were put into slavery because they owed a debt, could not pay a debt, and so they surmise that when Paul talks about um, covering the expense, that he's referring to the expense that either Onesimus owed Philemon, or perhaps that Philemon would lose by allowing his slave to serve Paul and not himself. The last theory is called the intercession theory. In this theory, um, scholars claim that Onesimus asks Paul to intervene with Philemon. So there has been some kind of dispute between Onesimus and Philemon. And because Onesimus is of such a lower um, social standing because he's a slave, he goes to Paul because he knows that Paul and Philemon have a relationship and he knows that Paul can intercede for him. And we do know that this was um, a possibility that, that you could ask somebody of a higher status to intercede for you. So this is, that much is certainly plausible. Um, in this case, throughout the letter, Paul acts as an intercessor. So he sends Onesimus back to Philemon with this inter intercessory letter. And in it, he recounts Onesimus's conversion, but also says that he will cover the debt. And this theory tends to leave open what that debt could be. Um, perhaps Onesimus stole money, or perhaps he had something and lost it, or perhaps he owed Philemon money because of slavery. We're not sure. And this theory um, kind of allows for multiple possibilities and doesn't always focus on the question of why Onesimus ends up with Paul, except to suggest that Onesimus chooses to go to Paul to ask him to intercede for him. So these are three different readings of Philemon. And I offer them because I think they remind us that not everything is easy to interpret, um, but certainly when it comes to the issue of slavery, there are multiple ways to read this letter and, and they're worth paying attention to um, because the issue of slavery is still happening today. Um, and, and it might be helpful to just know that there are multiple ways that people have wrestled with this letter. But the letter isn't just about slavery. And in fact, the letter to Philemon talks quite a bit about family. So that's what I want us to look at now. Now this is the, the letter to Philemon, but I put a lot of different colors on here. Um, and I did that because what we know is that whatever theory we believe about what's going on behind the scenes, we know that Paul is using and developing the kinship ties that he has with Philemon to get Philemon to act in a certain way, particularly when it comes to Onesimus. And so throughout this letter, Paul draws on their shared devotion to the Messiah and Lord Jesus and to their mutual father. And he does this to shape how they relate to each other and to others in the community, um, people in prison, in the ecclesia, and in the household. So in short, Paul's saying, because of Jesus, we're family, so act like it. That doesn't necessarily solve questions of slavery, of course, because family could include slaves. So it's not certain that he's pleading for manumission, but it's equally as possible that he is asking Philemon to free Onesimus. Um, certainly Philemon is patron to the Ecclesia and to Paul. He appears as the pater familias. So Paul uses this kind of familial language to suggest to Philemon that he has some responsibility both to Paul and to Onesimus and he should be caring for others. And in return, the others will give him honor and service. So again, not always clear what he wants, what he wants Philemon to, what Paul wants Philemon to do when it comes to Onesimus, but certainly he expects them to be acting like a family. Then the question becomes, well, what does a family look like if everyone is a follower in Christ? Does slavery exist if we're all followers of Christ? And and we know from early Christian history that that they wrestled with that question. Um, some of them freed all slaves. Some people sold themselves into slavery to free other slaves. And some people participated in slavery. So if they're a little bit all over the board. Um, 
One of the things that I should note is that Paul and Philemon certainly have a complicated relationship, and I'll point that out here um, in a little bit. But Paul does expect that their relationship with Christ will determine and transform their relationship with others. So listen to the language. I'm just going to look at some of the highlighted verses. So he's he uses uh, familial language to remind Philemon of all of their relationships. So Timothy is our brother, not my brother, not your brother, our brother. Philemon is our dear friend, our beloved, um, our co-worker. So this is a, a somebody we're working together. We're beloved. Friend isn't the best translation, but a, a beloved one. Um, sister, fellow soldier to the ecclesia. So an ecclesia would be a group of people who were gathered together, um, a, an assembly, so a group. Um, and who are they? Well, this is a group who claim God as their father and their Lord as Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. And so from the beginning, Paul is establishing, hey, we are family. Then when he's going to talk, um, he says, hey, and when I talk to my God, you know, I hear of your love for the saints, your faith towards Lord Jesus, what we're um, in this together, what we, we may do for Christ. And he again calls Philemon brother, I mean, he's using language of working together, a shared kinship, a shared mission. And then Paul, again, constantly reminding them that he's in relationship with Christ, um, is, you know, using language of love when he's, you know, he loves Philemon, but also he loves his child, Onesimus. He's become his father. Onimus, Onesimus is now Paul's own heart. He has substituted for Philemon in his place, but now, you know, Onesimus is no longer a slave. He's a beloved brother, both in the flesh and in the Lord. I mean, this is, this is all familial language. And so Paul can plead with him, okay, so as your partner, you know, welcome him as you would welcome me. And brother, you know, I know that you'll benefit me. I know that you'll do what family does and you'll help me out. You'll refresh my heart in Christ. And to kind of further cement this, you know, he ends with, hey, prepare a guest room. I'm coming to visit and I'm going to, I'm going to come because you're praying for this to happen. So he's establishing again, all of these ties, all of this kinship. And again, referring to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who is their shared patron, their, their shared, um, the one who makes them family. And in the blue, I used some language that Paul kind of plays with, but doesn't, but does. And um, I said, it's a complicated relationship. I mean, he's definitely saying, you know, I could command you to do your duty and I'm not going to, because I don't want to force you. But of course, he's basically saying, of course, you're obligated to do it. Um, and you're obligated because, well, you owe me your own self, but hey, I'm not even going to mention that. That's probably one of my favorite letters in scripture when Paul says, I say nothing about your owing me even your own self, because basically what he says is, I'm not going to say it, but he says it. And it's just, it's great rhetoric. Um, he's also using language of obedience when he calls himself an old man. I mean, this is really a kind of reminder of, hey, and you should respect my authority and my position, and I could force you to do this and force you to obey, but hey, I'm giving you a chance to act this way. I mean, in some ways, you can almost hear Paul as a father saying to a son, hey, I know that you want to make the right decision, and I know I could tell you what you should do, but I'm going to trust you to do what's right, even though I could remind you of how much you owe me, but I know that you'll do the right thing. And certainly that's going on. And this works because even though Philemon and Paul aren't related in blood, they, as far as we know, have no real blood ties. They are family, and they're family because they share the same Father God and they both are devoted to and live in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we consider the theology of such a little letter that doesn't seem to have deep theology in terms of no Christ hymns, no long exposition of what Christ has done for us or how God is working, we actually find that there is a theology that somehow in Christ we're made into a family. And in Christ, we share the same God, our Father. And because we're related to one another through Christ, then we have certain obligations, we have certain relationships. And if that's not theology, I don't know what is. Um, so certainly, Paul is telling us, hey, 
this very theology, this what we know about Christ and what he does for us, tells us how we should act and how our lives should be transformed and how we should engage with one another. And so I offer some reflection questions this week um, based on what we just discussed to see if we might think um, in light of Philemon and Onesimus and Paul um, about our own relationships. So first, what are our relationships within the community, in our church community, in other communities that um, we play a role? What are our relationships like? Where, what is our position? Um, what roles do we play? Are we someone whom other Christians can approach? So Paul certainly feels that he can approach Philemon and Onesimus, at least if we're going with, say, the intercession theory or the sent slave theory, or maybe even the fugitive slave theory, believes that he can approach Paul. So are we, like Paul, like Philemon, approachable people? Are we people whom others can seek for help, for guidance, for intercession, for prayer? Um, and if not, how can we be cultivating a Christ-like spirit so that we might um, be able to be somebody who is hospitable and open and welcoming? Kind of on the flip side of that, are we willing to ask for help for ourselves and for others? Are we willing to be like Onesimus and ask Paul for help? Are we willing to be like Paul and ask Philemon for help, to prepare a guest room and to do what he's asking? I mean, we certainly see in this um, examples of people being willing to ask one another for help. Are we willing to act that way? And are we willing to be humble enough to ask people in our Christian family for help if we need it, whether it be spiritual help, could you pray for me, or material help, could, could you provide a meal? I mean, what are we doing and how are we acting? Are we willing to ask for help and are we willing to give help? And then last and again, as in part one, in what ways can we seek to be family to one another? And what does that look like practically? How do we live in relation to people in our household, our church, our global church? Do we treat one another as family? Do we appreciate that we are a family? Do we praise God for making us a family in Christ? And how do we act and engage with one another so that we really do represent God's family here on earth, um, a family where all have the hope of salvation and all of us are brothers and sisters in Christ because we share the same Messiah, the same Lord, the same Savior, Jesus, and we share the same Father, God the Father. Food for thought. Please feel free to join us on Sunday at 9 a.m. for Zoom, where we'll be looking at a passage from Romans 16. And thank you for your time. God's peace be with you.